I'm Simon Sweeney, and this is the inaugural and probably the only ever episode of the most imaginatively named Simon's Podcast. Today, I'll be talking about the military, with a focus on the portrayal of military life in Eric Maria Remarque's 1928 novel, All Quiet on the Western Front. This novel remains a classic for its realistic depiction of war, ranging from the hilarious hijinks to disturbingly br- brutal depictions of the World War I battlefield. Many of its themes can be found in the experiences of those in the military across all places, cultures, and times. A key theme found consistently within the novel is that of camaraderie, as most strongly exemplified by the bonding of the main character's platoon. This is contrasted with these brutal scenes of war found in the other ones, in which many of these characters die. To add some context and personal meaning to this theme, I've interviewed Paul Beer Sr., a former member of the United States Navy, to share some of his experiences with military life. Let's go to him now. This is going to be the interview portion of the podcast where we're going to talk to uh, Mr. Beer about uh, his experiences in the military and related a little bit to some of the themes in the book. So uh, if you could just introduce yourself and uh, give a little bit of an overview of uh, your time uh, in the, spent in the military. Yeah, my name is Paul Beer. Uh, Paul Beer Sr. now. I joined the Navy in March of 1997. I broke service. I, I did a four-year contract and I got out in 1991. Just after Desert Storm, Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Eleven months later, I received a letter that asked if I'd like to uh, return to service. They would be happy to take me back in. At that point, I took them up on their offer and went back in on a two-year reenlistment that was cut short to just under a a month short of two years. I got downsized uh, when Bill Clinton took office. He downsized the military, and I was part of that. What the book does is it kind of gives, uh, it's narrated from the character's perspective, also named Paul, and he gives kind of a day-to-day overview of what's happening with his uh, group. So what was a day-to-day life like? See, now, my day-to-day life was more like a job. I mean, there wasn't, you know, in the Navy, at least in my Navy, the amphibious Navy, I mean, you got, they break them down. The amphibious Navy had its own naval base in Norfolk, Virginia. We were based in Little Creek. You know, then the real Navy, we called it, was over in Norfolk, the Naval Station, Norfolk, Virginia. That's where the, the carriers were. And along with the carrier, you'd always have a battle group with you to protect the carrier. We called them showboats. That's where the high ranking officers were. That's where spit polish, spit shine, everybody, you know, was impeccable uniforms. My Navy was more about was I worked on the ship's engines. I mean, it would be Reveille would probably be at 6 a.m., and you would go to muster, which would be inspection at 7 o'clock in the morning. A lot of times they were above decks. On uh, We landed a helicopter on my first ship, first two. So if, if the weather was good, we'd go up there, we'd have a meeting. The supervisors would then break off, we'd have another meeting, and then it would be down into the engine rooms, and it would be maintaining the engines. We would check the viscosity of the oil once once every hour to see if that was breaking down from the detergents in the diesel fuel, whether they needed to add oil. It was it was a lot of once we were you know running them, it was a matter of keeping them running. And when they weren't running, it was a matter of uh, maintenance. Mm-hmm. So it was you know every week you had probably four different maintenance tasks that needed done, and they were broke down into you know like a daily, a weekly, mm-hmm. monthly, yearly, quarterly. So, you know, if you had nothing to do, then you went into your maintenance file and see what needed to be done by Friday, whatever that may be. I mean, it could have been as simple as checking the valves, any type of valve to see if they were leaking, if they, you know, if they were in good working order. That was, you know, that was about it. So you'd start at seven. I mean, what you would do is at seven o'clock, you'd have your best decent looking uniform on to go up. And then you would change into your greasy or your coveralls and you'd hit the engine rooms and you'd work till, you know, lunchtime. Usually take an hour off. You go back down for two or three hours, and and that would be it for the day. Mm-hmm. However, if you were at the sea, you would do all that, but at the same time you would have to stand watch. So, so what I'm saying is, like during Desert Storm for six months, for over six months, I was six months, six hours on, six hours off. So I was standing and watching an engine room for six hours, monitoring the temperatures, and then I would have six hours off. To sleep. However, if those six hours off started at noon during working hours, you weren't allowed to sleep. So you would work some more, and then you would try to get three or four more hours before you went back on for 
the midnight shift. So, I mean, I was basically sleeping five hours a day for over six months. So, the, like, the import and the, and the at sea were, were a lot different because, I mean, the, the import stuff was a lot of, you know, you could goof off. You could, a lot of goofing off as long as the maintenance work got done. But when you were out to sea, you work like a dog. It was, it was never ending. Hey, you say a lot of goofing off, and like what, what is uh, portrayed in this book is that all the guys are good friends and like have a lot of fun. So is that something? Well, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, goofing off would be, you know, not, if you had to watch, you showed up to, you know, your, your station on time or you were in trouble, but it wasn't as important because your engines weren't lit off. Your, you, we weren't making our own water. We weren't making our own steam, our own hot water. We weren't making our own electricity because we were pure side. We were plugged in, so you know, to pure services. So for an engine, an engine man like myself, I, I didn't have much to do. You know what I mean? Because we were getting everything from pure services. So things were pretty slack because we knew once we got to sea, we worked harder. The, the engineers worked harder than just about everybody but the deck crew. You know, it was. You learned something from it, but it wasn't the easiest job, that's for sure. It, but as far as goofing off i mean camaraderie what it was all about i mean and, and i think that's a lot of people transitioning getting out and getting back into civilian life even if it was a couple of years or it was four years or 20 years you're never going to find that anywhere but there yeah exactly. you, you never you're never going to find you might have had your best friend when you went to high school and whatever with that you grew up with but if you're with a guy you know with your best bud for three years in the navy you were with him three years 24 7 you know, especially overseas, you know, and you hung out, you know, we all kind of all stayed together. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, that I, I feel like that's part of the, part of the, you know, for me, you know, the culture shock was, you know, your buds aren't your buds like they were then, maybe, you know. Yeah. That, that's also uh, a big theme in the book is when I, he comes back, he goes on leave and there's a little bit of a culture shock. Is the, could you elaborate yeah. a bit on that? Yeah, I mean, well, for one important thing is uh, for every year you serve, you get 30 days vaca paid vacation a year. Mm -hmm. But my Navy, and most most Navy, you know, I don't I can't really speak to the other branches, but you couldn't say, OK, I'm going to take the month of July off and I'll see you in August. They never wanted you away for 30 days. Mm -hmm. You could get seven but you weren't getting 30 days because they didn't want you back getting acclimated back into a civilian lifestyle with people that you, you know, that aren't military. So that, you know, unless you were changing duty stations and you were going from the East coast, say to the West coast, and you had a family, you could probably get your 30 days there, mm -hmm. you know, your relocation leave. But, uh, that's one of the reasons you weren't getting your 30 days all one. You know, they wanted, they wanted you back and they wanted to keep you close. And to minimize that, that that's an <laughs> right. That's an interesting aspect for sure. And, and, I, and I believe that most branches are like that. Yeah. You know, and if you do your four years at the end, you know, people that get out at four years, you almost always have 50, 60 days of vacation on the books that you sell back. Mm -hmm. Because you, there's just not enough time to take 30 days every year. You just, you weren't getting 30 days vacation a year. You were getting Christmas or New Year's. You weren't getting both. <laughs> you know, if you were in port, you know, and you weren't, you weren't deployed somewhere. You weren't getting Christmas and New Year's. There was this holiday and this one or that one, and that's all you got. And you got seven, you know, five to seven days, and you had to be back. So, so in the book, uh, you give us a little bit of a day-to-day -day life, but uh, obviously in the book, there's a lot of uh, rapid-fire things that happen to them because it's dramatic. It's a, it's a story. Particular, like notable experiences, like a, a days that stand out. Wow. Um, well, I mean, like a lot of them, I mean, let's go, you know, so, so the book's wartime. So let's go wartime when I was in Desert Storm. Mm -hmm. That was at the very end of my four year uh, enlistment. So that was like, let's say the last seven months of my, my four years was spent in war, in wartime. And it was, it was actually wartime cruising. Mm -hmm. So we manned, um, Battle stations were manned 24/7. There was a, there was always somebody in the, in the magazine ready to load the big guns. There was always somebody at a smaller gun, like a 50 caliber gun, in case small boat would come up and try to attack us that way. So I mean, we, we were always at a wartime and that wartime cruising, and that's pretty rough. I mean, because again, I'm saying five hours sleep. Well, you know, I'm working down there, but it's you know. 
at the same time, battles, battle stations were always manned. Uh, it was, and again, now you, you got to remember this is 1990, 91. There was no cell phones. There was no Skype. There was none of this. So like during the day, somebody's, somebody's sister sent him a transistor radio. So we would go up to the main deck, the weather decks, but we would listen to the news and, and we would tell by listening to the news, let's just say everybody back here stateside knew more about what was going on than we knew what was going on on that ship unless we heard we were able to get it on um, on a radio station that we were able to pick up in, a, in, in the Persian Gulf or the North Arabian Sea or, or wherever it was, you know, was we were at that time. We, we rotated in. We would rotate in to the Persian Gulf and, like, Six six amphibious ships would go in. Six amphibious ships would come out, and we'd go in do patrols and and rotate in. So if you weren't in the Persian Gulf, you were in the North Arabian Sea waiting to go in, or waiting to get a call for everybody to come in. So I mean, notable. Um, I I I don't know. I mean, nothing that really sticks out. There was so many. Yeah, that's something that that really gets portrayed is that it's a uh, it's a lot like pretty constant. You know, you know, the thing about that is the three years prior to that, my second year in, I did a six month Mediterranean cruise, summer Mediterranean cruise, where we stopped at. We were in Spain, we were in France, we were in, in Palma, Mallorca, the island in, off in the Mediterranean. We were in Ibiza, the island right next to that. This is where the rich Europeans go to vacation, the northern Europeans. So, I mean, we partied. You know what I mean? You know, and, and we were in port. It was a big party. But, you know, when the war started, it was there was none of that. You know, I mean, it, it was it was fun. And then it wasn't fun. You know, I mean, for, for the, that duration. And, and honestly, after that, I'm sure not, nobody was able to get the kind of liberty that we got. I mean, I we were in Marseille, France, and I well, we had to pay for it. So I paid for a tour and you would get on a tour bus and we went to Paris. And we were on our own. You know, we got a hotel room. There was a group of us, but you're still on your own, and you're walking the streets of France like they're, like nothing. Same with Israel. I took a tour when I was when we were in Haifa, Israel, for a couple of weeks on that same Mediterranean cruise. Me and a friend of mine took a, uh, a a tour that was probably I think it was three days long, and we stayed in Tel Aviv, and we we took tours during the day, but at night we they still call it a disco tax. You know, we'd go out. In, in Tel Aviv and go to the discos and drink and do whatever. And we weren't allowed out all night either. I mean, it was usually Cinderella Liberty. You had to be back in by midnight. Unless you were on one of those, you paid to have a tour. And then there really wasn't a whole lot of chaperones going on there. Yeah, that uh, aligns really nicely with a lot of uh, what's said, where sometimes they'll be in one chapter, they'll be uh, having a lot of fun at a port somewhere. And then the next, they'll be like in war and they'll be that type of mode. So that's... Uh, Yep. I think that switch. Yeah, because actually, like in Desert Storm, my ship was a, it was an LST. It was a tank. That's a, a, a tank landing ship. That's where the LST, uh, that, that's where the prefix comes from there. But we were out to sea mostly because of me being a diesel, my, my department being a, the ones that ran the ships, the engines. And, you know, we kept everything. We kept the electricity on. We kept everything going. We went four and a half months straight to, out, out to sea. That that's pretty much unheard of ever anywhere unless you're like a submarine. So for reward for that, we got Christmas and New Year's in port from probably one of the admirals above. So I mean, actually, just before Desert Storm started, I was in I believe Abu Dhabi, and. We all pitched in and got a hotel room, and we still had to be back to the ship, but it wasn't like taking a nice shower in a nice five-star hotel, making phone calls home from the lobby, you know, stuff like that. So we did, but, you know, the funny thing is we, three days later, we got back on that ship, and three days later, that war started. So three days before that, we were drinking Heineken's in Abu Dhabi, and, you know, next thing you know, we were in Desert Storm the very, you know, days later. That's a... Uh really interesting that uh, switch there yeah the novel obviously uh, all quiet on the western front is a dramatic portrayal of uh, a war do you like read or uh, watch a lot of dramatic portrayals like movies or books do you have uh, any comments on like the realism of them 
Yeah, I mean, sure. Oh, absolutely. You know, in some of the old ones that don't, some of the old Navy movies that that don't pop into my head, but um, they seem to be more true to life. And I mean, the ones that were made, you know, probably in the fifties, right after World War II. You know, nowadays, I mean, like, let's say Hunt for Red October. Are you familiar at all? I mean, with with that, that's relatively new. Yeah. Now that at least that was a submarine, so. I'm not completely, I've never been on a sub, but I've had them tied up next to us on, you know, they tied up next to my ship before Mm -hmm. in port. So, you know, I know what they're about, you know, Mm -hmm. but I I believe that that was fairly true to life, except for the premise. I mean, there really was no Russian captain of a submarine ever going to try to just float Mm -hmm. one of their nuclear powered submarines into wherever he was coming in, Hudson Bay in New York. That was a little far-fetched, but the rest of it, as far as the, the structure of the, the chain of command and, and all that, that that's all seemed pretty pretty true to life, sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you. I think that's all we have. former Navy SEALer Paul Beer Sr. talking about his experiences from his time spent in the military. Over the course of the interview, his story is connected to a few themes of the novel. One of particular interest is the divide between good times spent out of action and the rigorous times of war, exactly as seen in the back-and-forth nature of the chapters in All Quiet on the Western Front. Mr. Beer addressed the divide between the two. His description of the camaraderie of his group is very similar to the friendship we see in the novel amongst Paul Bomber and his friends. He also mentions the culture shock felt by those who go on leave, which we see in the story as Paul visits home and experiences this culture shock, being unable to relate to many of the issues at home. Of course, his is more extreme, but the same basic principle stays in place. The tactic of keeping leave periods short so as to minimize this culture shock is definitely a move I wouldn't have considered, that it ends up giving us a really interesting look into the more everyday basic workings of the military. The element I certainly came away with the most from was how similar the depictions of the shift in mood was between time off and between, and more time between Mr. Beer's interview and All Quiet. These experiences tie together across places and times and portray both uh, positive and negative aspects to being a part of the military, although All Quiet naturally maintains a far darker tone and much more brutal depiction of war, tipping the scale a little bit more that way. Thank you for listening. Thanks to Paul Beer Sr. for sharing his time and stories. Thanks to Skype, Audacity, and GarageBand for playing integral roles in the production of this podcast. The music you heard was The Outlier and Walls, both produced by myself. Thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.